Now let's speak about vulnerabilities. So the, why why are we protecting assets? Because the assets are vulnerable. And if we want to protect a specific asset, and we're gonna end up implementing uh, security measures based on the classification of the asset and the vulnerability of the asset. Like for example, for, for assets classified as public or unclassified, there's no need to even to, to, to identify if those are vulnerable or not because since are publicly available, you don't even care if that information leaks out or not. For that information, you only care that information is available. So for those, for the assets which are publicly available to the whole internet, like you know, a, a, cl a, a claim or a um, description of the organization's, uh, let's say, um, of the organization's role and scope, then because that's publicly available, f from the attacks point of view, you only care that information is reachable and available at all times towards the user towards the you know towards the users who want to know more about your company and more about your organization but in, in some cases you don't even care if like the uh, you, you don't even care to pr do a proper assessment to identify what is the likeliness that a publicly available resource can become unavailable and then if it's going to stay unavailable for one hour then is organization good or not with that behavior in some cases, a lot of organizations don't even go into that detail for publicly, av publicly available, available data. Rather, they focus on the service. Because as long as the web service is functional, and that's not an asset, so we have to differentiate between the web service and the data available on that web server. So if we want the data to be available because all of the data which is there is, is, is classified as public, so we don't care who sees the data, it means that we only need to provide availability, which means we're not going to provide any countermeasures or any kind of uh, solutions to make sure that the data is available. We're going to make sure we guard the web service. So we're going we're gonna to provide adequate uh, technologies like redundancy to make sure that the, to make sure that the web service runs and provides its services 99.9 .9 of the time. But about the data stored on those um, on on that web services, we don't provide any kind of uh, let's say uh, security countermeasures or security solutions in there. So it's much more uh, productive, much more cost effective to look at who can be attacked. Because the data being stolen, we don't care because it's publicly available, but the way that data can become unavailable is by somebody attacking the web service. So there we go. You're going to focus on the web service in that case. Either way, the point is that in order to, once you have identified and classified your assets, which means you know what you have, what do you have to protect, which assets have to be protected, then you have to identify based on those asset types, what are the vulnerabilities that those assets are being exposed to. And that can be, that is going to be likewise classified into um, many, let's say, categories. It can be policy flows, which that's going to be like a, a security policy flow, which for example, uh, let's say that in order to change your Windows password, um, so, so let's say that your company's uh, passwords, Windows password uh, policy states that the, the, the password has to be many on 10 characters with special characters with both capital and small letters, those kind of things, okay? But then, for example, the company security, but the system doesn't enforce that. So like the system allows you to do to put any password you want like you can put a simple password as cisco for example but then the 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 the, the, the password policy which is dictated by the company states you have to put password which are minimum 10 characters special characters in, in involved as well and both small and capitals in there 
So that's that's the security policy for 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 putting passwords for creating passwords, but then it's not enforced by uh, let's say specific technologies. So that can be no, can be seen as a um, policy flaw, or for example, maybe the security policy states how to create passwords to begin with, but a security policy doesn't state how to change your password which means that a user can end up, when it's gonna change his password, can end up actually using a simple password at Cisco because the, uh, the document which explains, which guides the user how to change its password allows the user to put any kind of password. So then the user is gonna choose up a simple password. So that's like a, that's like a policy flow. Well, we can have a firewall policy flow, for example where you, you put firewalls in, in the network, and then because of the order of operation within the firewall, then a policy flow uh, showed up, and uh, more access to the network was given than otherwise was required to begin with. We have design flows, which for example, uh, that could one one example of design flow. We can speak about hardware design flows or software design flows, or network design flows. So it's different variations of design flows. Like a, 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 a hardware design flow could be, for example, that if somebody takes a specific action on a hardware physical device, then an unexpected behavior is gonna happen, right? That's gonna be a hardware design flow. A software design flow is like a bug within the code. Uh, not a bug within the code, but it is due to um, let's say bad programming, which means that the the developer who programmed that specific uh, software didn't follow up on a best practices or on a secure way of writing code down, and it ended up with a software design flow. Or network design flow is where you design the network without seeing everything which is attached to the network and you may fail to oversee that in a specific region of the network you have some sp some assets which should have been protected or safeguarded against specific types of attacks protocol built-in flows like each protocol has a lot of flows like for example http has built-in flows uh, ssl has built-in flows tls has built-in flows which of course they were because of bad programming or failure to oversee how that protocol is gonna be uh, used in the end, but it, it, it's, it's actually uh, another kind of flow. Software flows, we were speaking about us quite a lot, could be in, in the format of bugs in general, and I hope everybody is aware of what a bug is, a software bug is when the system is configured to behave in a certain way, but then it ends up behaving in a different way. That's a software flow or a bug. Misconfiguration flows, like the example I gave you with the with the firewall, where the you should, for example, if you look at the network in here, let's say that you want users to be able to go this side again being the LAN. So in here you have the LAN side, and in here you have the internet side internet then you may want the, your security engineers to configure the firewall in such a way that inbound access from the internet inbound access from the internet is available only for a destination of the server let's say 12, 12, 12, 12 on TCP port 443. So that's the only kind of traffic you would allow people from the internet to send in your network. So that should be your file rules security policy from the internet. But accidentally because for example, one common use case which happens in real-life deploy real deployments because the engineer that has configured the firewall is not exactly aware of the entire architecture of that firewall. So how does that firewall work? 
because although we have a lot of vendors that have different kinds of firewalls and pretty much all of them tend to do the same thing. They follow up on the same results. The implementation is different. So then as an engineer was used to configure a Palo Alto firewall in a specific way to provide this kind of access, but then he moves around to a Cisco firewall to provide the same kind of access because he's not aware yet with the architecture of that firewall, then he may accidentally end up to allow more access than actually required because he's not aware how the firewall works end to end. So he knows what he has to do he knows he has to allow that specific traffic only, but he's not aware how to actually uh, make sure uh, that he's going to implement that properly on the firewall because he's not yet knowledgeable enough with the firewall operating the system and architecture as designed by the vendor. Then this is actually very common. Uh, this is actually a very common mistake when engineer engineers move on from vendor A to vendor B on the same security product, but it's going to be different visions of the vendors, which end up ends up in different implementations and behaviors to achieve the same thing. And then is human flaws, which are probably uh, the most difficult ones to defend against. We're going to see based on a couple of types of attacks. What does a human flaw mean? Basically, it is um, it is the uh, the option or the attack, the the time when the attacker manipulates people in order to gain specific access to specific information or just to obtain uh, immediate, uh, let's say, results. We're going to speak about it uh, in in a couple of uh, seconds. So the the human flaws are actually the most difficult ones to protect against. And we're going we're gonna to see uh, in a couple. The other ones, like even the, the design flaws or even the protocol built-in flaws, as soon as you're aware of those, it's, way, it's, it's, it's faster and simpler to uh, protect, to, uh, to put in security solutions to defend against, uh, against those flaws as, as opposed to putting in some security measures to defend against human flaws, human errors. There are a couple of publicly available list of vulnerabilities, uh, both classification and general system vulnerability management on those two websites. Now, of course, those are only general guidelines. They, are, they, have, they have very, very good, let's say, materials on those two websites. So again, it's, it's both for vulnerability classification and also for a, a general approach of how should you deal with the vulnerability management within a organization. Okay, let's see if you have any questions before we continue. Okay, not really, it's expected because this is theory, but even if, 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 as I was saying, if today's class is mostly theory, you know, whatever is unclear or whatever, uh, let's say, is it's quite new to you or you have not understood it properly from my explanations, you can go ahead and put questions uh, in there.